Amen. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> we need more than ever in these days to familiarize ourselves with the Word of God, for much deception is in the land. And many, many people who started greatly out for God have been detoured off the path of truth. The only way we can stay on it is through the Word of God. I've been pastoring 38 years. I've seen a lot of people come and a lot of people go. And I would say this to you. If you're going to make a move, do it slowly. Be careful. The devil is good at panicking people and pushing them into sudden decisions they'll regret the rest of their lives. But Jesus gently leads, and I believe he's going to continue to do that, don't you? Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 2, therefore, we talked in the first chapter this morning. Remember, we ended up with the ministering spirits for those who shall be the heirs of salvation. Therefore, because of this, because Jesus brought a better covenant than angels, because he brought better th things for us than had ever been before. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. It's easy to let things slip. Did you know that? Let me mention this to you. When you're young, you think that if you don't come up with some new doctrine every three to six months, some wonderful, flashy, brand new spiritual toy to play with, that you're in a rut. And I went through that too. I think everybody does. And it's good to discover new things. It's not that new things are not there to discover. But you know, the basic fundamentals of the faith are still there. They're the bedrock on which you rest. And if you don't have those, you don't have nothing. And so don't ever um, say, oh, I've, I've read this before. Did you ever do that? And then you read it again. The Lord said, well, go ahead and read it. And you read it, and all of a sudden you get something fresh and new. See, we're never going to empty the Word of God. We're never going to empty the wells that he has put here for us to drink from. The river is flowing. You can drink when the water is going by. You can drink other water later, but you'll never get this water again. It's going by. You can dip and drink, dip and drink. But that which goes by will never be available again. Not exactly the same. You can have other water, but not that water. That's why it behooves us to be in the place where God wants us to be when he speaks and when he moves to help and bless his people. He said we ought to give earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Did you ever have some truths slip away from you? Did you ever have some truths that you were blessed with, some Bible truths? And at times, you, you really lived in these. You walked in them, and they were so great and so blessed. And then time went along, and you got involved in some other things. And gradually, they, you sort of let them slip out of your memory for a while. And then one day, you were studying the Word, or maybe you were in a service somewhere, and all of a sudden, the Lord brought it back fresh. The same truth that you had known before, but hadn't used in a long time. And it's all fresh again. That's why I like to mark my Bibles. I hope you don't have a Bible that you don't mark. You say, well, I, don't, I want to keep it nice and clean. Oh, that's no good. Get you a, a nice colored pencil of some kind to mark it with. And when you read a verse that means something special to you, that really speaks to your heart, that really blesses you, mark it. Or when you run across a verse that illustrates a point you want to remember, mark it. Sometimes you can sit down and go back and just read the marked verses and you'll be surprised at how much you've forgotten. You'll say, oh, wow, I'm glad I marked that. Wow, is that ever great? I hadn't thought about that in months. And yet because you marked it, it jumped off the page when you turned the page. So don't be afraid to mark your... Um, because we are, it's a, we are able to let the truth slip away from us at times. He said, if every word spoken by angels was steadfast, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense and reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? 
God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, divers miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now God's word is to go forth in power. And you've heard me say this over and over again. We've only scratched the surface. We're only just beginning to understand some of the things that God has to teach us, right? I believe that evangelism, deliverance, and healing are God's program for the New Testament church. Everything else is pointed up and wrapped up in those three main ministries. When they operate to the fullest, the supernatural gifts will operate. Prayer will prevail. Bible study will come. All of these other things are wrapped up in those main thrusts. And of course, I believe that deliverance is the only thing rough enough, strong enough, powerful enough to break through to get people where they can do intercessory prayer. You get a bunch of people full of demons trying to do intercessory prayer, and the demons will play games with them. You need to do some cleaning up first. Now, that doesn't mean wait till I get pure and perfect before I pray. Uh, you, 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 nobody could stand you if you did. I mean, you'd be full of pride because you were great that you wouldn't want to pray with anybody. You know, don't touch me, I'm holy. Well, there's nothing wrong with holiness, real holiness, but real holiness comes from within. And I've met some people who are, quote, holy, unquote, but it didn't match up with what the Bible talks about. If you are holy, you don't have to talk about it. It shows. And if you're not holy, then you ought to work on it. That gives all of us a job, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Have you had anybody run you down lately and say, oh, you're so holy, please let me touch you? Mm -hmm. Have you ever had anybody run up to you lately and say, would you put a cloth over your face? Your face shines so from being with the presence of the Lord. I can't stand to look at you. I had somebody run up and say, would you please cover your face? But that wasn't because it was shining. They just didn't like my looks. You see what I'm talking about, people? It's practical, everyday living. We've got a long way to go. And as we move, you see, everything in God's program has a purpose. You get saved because that's foundational. How should we escape unless we, uh, the, if we neglect so great salvation? The answer is there is no escape. If you don't take advantage of God's so great salvation, you haven't got anything. But it starts with great, that's so great salvation, but that's only the beginning of what God is doing. Then he wants to deliver us from evil spirits, and he wants to heal us from our diseases. And my, we're a long way from that, aren't we? I've been around some people who were, I believe, genuinely holy people. And they were still plagued with some kinds of ailments and diseases. Strange, isn't it? That means, that tells me something. We haven't cracked this thing yet. But I believe that God has more for us than we, than we know about. And I believe the deliverance is a way to bore in there and find out where it is. When we begin to get delivered... It sets us free to study God's Word. How many of you, think back in your own life, how many of you were so confused, so mixed up when you first came here, it was hard for you to concentrate to read the Scriptures even? So if you go to some church where they say, read the Scriptures, it wouldn't do you a bit of good. How can anybody read the Scriptures who can't even concentrate? If they tell you, well, get out and pray, and all you do is hallucinate demons... That's not going to get you very close to the Lord, is it? And we have some people in our fellowship. Uh, our assistant pastor, Mike, had almost that bad of trouble when he first came here. He would have never gotten on his feet without deliverance. He could have never moved into other realms without deliverance. Many of you, me, all of us, I came from a religious background. you got to get shed of that before you can start moving in the Lord. Did you know that? You now people say, well, when? You know, he's an old Baptist. Well, the Baptists didn't say so. They said, I was a maverick. I didn't fit. Isn't that funny? Now that I'm out of the Baptist group, people are saying, well, the trouble with Wynn is he's an old Baptist. When I was in the Baptist fold, they said, he don't fit. And you know, you're feeling kind of funny at times. You think, well... The Baptists say you got too much for them. 
The other bunch said, we don't like what you got over here. I guess you just better strike out and find out what the Lord's will is and do that, hadn't you? The best you know how. And the thing is, people, we just got to face up to the fact that all of us are a bunch of imperfect people walking together trying to get things in order for the Lord in our lives. And only by his Holy Spirit and his word can we do it. It's not going to be done by some uh, super duper person coming in and touching everybody. It's going to be done by the touching of the power of the Spirit of God and his word. And I frankly don't know any fast way to do it. It's, a, it's, an uphill, it's an uphill walk. Did Jesus perfect Peter and the others overnight? Think back. Sons of thunder, James and John. Shall we call down fire on this village that wouldn't have you come and speak, Lord? They call them the sons of thunder with good reason. They could really thunder. Took a while. James became the pillar of the church in Jerusalem, but it took a lot of doing. They called him old camel knees because he spent so much time on his knees. He had calluses on his knees. Wonder where our calluses are. <laughs> and then, then you have uh, Peter up and down like a yo-yo, on and off like a neon sign, either burning up or ice cold. Well, I wouldn't have picked him for my bunch, would you? Jesus did. He picked him and he picked a winner. Took some doing for him to get there, but he got there. You know, I've, I've run across a lot of people say, well, I wouldn't pick Win Worley to be a spokesman. I wouldn't either. I sometimes feel sorry for the Lord. He must be rubbing the bottom of the barrel, you know. But you know, it's the people that God picks that do things that nobody else can. I've had people look at me and say, do you pray? I said, yes, I do. I don't do a lot of it publicly. I don't do it around other people. Not a whole lot. Never have. I'm a kind of a private person. I do pray <clears throat> the very fact I've gotten this far demonstrates that. I might have prayed circles around some people who think they prayed more. I don't know. But I would say this. You better look at what's happening and build your foundation sure on salvation, deliverance, healing, and whatever God is preparing us for in that tremendous battle to defeat the enemy. I am personally convinced you'll never get people to pray with fervor and accuracy until they have some deliverance. And yet nearly every person I know of who's going out there, they, they talk a lot about holiness. Well, that's right. Holiness without which no man will see the Lord. That's right. You know where the holiness that that you that will cause you to see the Lord comes from? I got news from you. It doesn't come from people that they think where it thinks. That it comes from Jesus. You think your little holiness and my little holiness is going to mount to a hill of beans? And the, well, my Bible says all my righteousnesses are like filthy rags. If the best I do is like that, what do you think my bad things look like? The things that I say, well, they're not so hot. It's going to take the holiness of God to get us in. But that's all right. It's, it's available. Paid for. Praise the Lord. Our business is to get ready to be soldiers of Jesus Christ, to enter into the battle, to get as much deliverance from evil spirits as we can and pray as hard as we can for, for the rest of the battle to go for God's people, wherever they are. Amen? He said, God bore them witness with signs and wonders, divers, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost. I believe there's going to come a time, and I've spoken of it many times, when there's going to be a tremendous breakthrough with the gifts and the outpouring of supernatural miracles in the services. But God is preparing us right now. In the past, when he has poured out supernatural gifts on people that weren't prepared, the revival was short-lived. This one, I believe, is going to push a hole through the devil's wall. 
And God is taking time to clean up the people who will listen and are willing to go through. Now, if you just want to sit and be holy, then I don't know. Help yourself. If you can get it that way, praise the Lord. I've been that route. And then God told me, he said, get up off your do-nothing and organize an army. Call the army. Don't you see all those blow a trumpet in Zion? Call a solemn assembly. Go to spiritual warfare. If you want to fight, go to spiritual warfare. Go to battle with powers that be. And in this way, we're finding results. Oh, it's not spectacular. There's a battle every inch of the way. I wonder why. If it won't work, why would the devil fight us? Why wouldn't he fall back before us? And let the building fill with people. Hmm? Wouldn't that be in his favor to have a bunch of, of yelling fanatics here in order to pollute and corrupt the whole body of Christ? Think about it. The very opposition of the enemy, the determined and fierce and continued attacks of the enemy are dead sure proof positive that we have, we have found some of the truth. Now let's see if we can walk in it. God will give us some more when we get ready to, when we get where we handle this. Don't you believe that? Now, I'm convinced, too, there are other people scattered here, there, and yonder around the world that God's working with. Lord, have mercy if we're the only bunch he's got. Wouldn't that be pathetic? I can't believe a God as big as ours just has one little bunch to work with. Can you? And he's working with them. And there's going to become, there's going to come a time when the enemies will have his back broken. Now, you know, in an army... There are many different kinds of soldiers. They do different things, don't they? You have the infantry that hits the beaches, right? They roll over and they start moving forward. Then you have the, the, the tanks and other vehicles and artillery and everything follows that. Isn't that true? Now, I don't know exactly what... what part we're fulfilling, I know we're somewhere on the front, because there sure are a lot of bombs busting, excuse me, bursting all over. Hmm? We're at the battlefront, I'm sure of that. The enemy would not go to so much trouble to try to put us out of commission if we hadn't hit onto something that was extremely dangerous to his kingdom. This I am convinced of. Now, there may be some heavy artillery following us. I hope so. Wouldn't that be great? Hmm? I mean, I'd hate to get over there and tangle with those birds and look back and nobody behind us coming in. But I believe God's got backup troops. But he didn't tell me about those. He just said, you, take, you, you lead this bunch to go and attack the enemy and break his back. Open the prison doors, tear out the windows, tell the prisoners the good news that deliverance is available. Get them started reading their Bible and praying. And there'll be others coming to do other things that God wants done. But I believe this move of God is going to be the biggest one that's ever been seen. And without deliverance, I don't think it can be. Deliverance is the only thing that has never been used. Never. Check all the revival movements, and they've come and they've gone, but they've never used deliverance as the forerunner to break open the doors of the prison houses. So I'm looking for those signs and wonders, diverse miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost. We've had sprinklings of them, haven't we? We've seen some here then yonder. But I believe that's just an encouragement to go further. There's more, much, much more coming. Unto angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. He's talking, still talking about he's better than angels. He said, why, well, he didn't put the world under subjection to angels. <laughs> But in one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man thou visitest him, thou madest him a little lower than angels. Remember we talked about this this morning? Thou crownest him with glory and honor. 
didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that's not put under him. And now we see not yet all things put under him. Now God has already decreed that his son shall have everything under his feet. And yet the writer says, but now from where we're sitting, we don't yet see that complete victory. Now do you think God started something that's not going to finish it? Do you think he promised to put the world under subjection to his son's feet and he's going to leave off and say, well, son, we got it most of the way. But I guess we'll just call off. Say it was a bad job. We had too many, too many dropouts. I believe God's going to... And how is he going to do this? He's going to do it through his people. For he left us, you see, the power of the name of Jesus, the resurrection, the blood to go forward and crush into the enemy and smash into his fortresses, didn't he? But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man, for it became him, looked well on him, for whom are all things, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through blessings. That's not how the captain of our salvation was made perfect. He was made perfect through sufferings. And I find many people that are not willing to face the fact that if you're going to walk with Jesus, there's, there's suffering. You just might as well make up your mind to it. It's coming. If you walk with Jesus, if Jesus was made perfect, brought to perfection, brought to maturity, brought to the fullness that God wanted him to be through suffering, how do you think he's going to bring us? Some other route? If it was good enough for Jesus, you think it's good enough for you and me? If the captain of our salvation went through this, why should we think we shall be less? But I'll tell you this. Did you know that every believer does not suffer? God cannot trust every believer with suffering. I'm talking about suffering for Jesus' sake. The world's full of suffering. But suffering for Jesus' sake is in a different category. But it's suffering for Jesus' sake is something that is reserved for those whom he's going to take through and grow up in the Lord to do more. And I don't believe that everybody suffers for the Lord. Some of us suffer for our own stupidity. That's not suffering for the Lord. Some of us suffer for many things that we've brought on ourselves because we've broken God's word, because we've been stupid, because we've been ignorant, because we've been this, that, or the other. That's not suffering for Jesus. Suffering for Jesus is when you are living for the Lord and for no reason at all other than the cantankerousness of the devil crossing your path, you get whopped. And there's no reason whatsoever for this to hit you except the enemy is coming at you because Jesus is living in you effectively. And you'll suffer. It's not pleasant. Did Jesus always have a pleasant road? Did he? Think about him. Go back and check his record in the Gospels. No. He went through sufferings. He went through privations. Both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one. Now, don't go haywire on sanctify. Sanctify. All sanctify means is set apart. You can sanctify something. I have a big uh, can at my house that's sanctified for garbage. <laughs> it's the garbage can. Sanctifying means we've set it apart and that's what we put in there. And it doesn't smell good. We have to spray it every once in a while. You can be sanctified under honor or under dishonor. That's what the Bible says in Corinthians. But God's people are sanctified under honor as vessels unto honor. And he that sets us apart or sanctifies, and they who are set apart are all of one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. It's all done, it's a supernatural operation of the Lord himself. 
saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church or the assembly, will I sing praise to thee. And again, I put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God has given me. Did you know that you're a love gift from the Father to the Son? Did you know that if he lost even one of those that the Father gave him, he would be infinitely poor? You say, how do you, how do you figure that? Well, several places, but just one or one comes to pops in mind. How about that shepherd that had 99 sheep in the fold and one was out? Why didn't he say, oh, well, we got the majority? One little old sheep, what difference does that make? Just one sheep, more or less. Now, what did he do? He went out and got that one because it belonged to him too. Thank God for the one lost sheep, huh? Doesn't that give you hope? That even if you get strayed out here, the shepherd's going to come looking for you? He said he would. He doesn't want to be doing without you for eternity because you're a love gift from the Father to him. Many people don't realize this. You say, well, I don't think I'm much of a gift. Well, you're not, but before God gets through fixing Fixing you and me, we're going to be wonderful. Do you know that? Did you know that before you get to heaven, you're going to go through the blood? You know where the blood of Jesus is? You need to go looking for it on Calvary's mountain over there. He had to present his blood to the Father. Peter calls that blood precious blood. Precious the blood of Jesus was so precious and so pure, I don't think a single drop of it was lost. You say, well, I don't agree with you. Well, we'll ask Jesus when we get there. But I'm convinced he was the great high priest. He was serving as priest. And he went to the Father and presented his blood in the heavenlies. And that's the thing that made the reconciliation. And that blood will make you and me completely whole. Did you know when you're presented to the Father, you're going to be perfectly whole? You won't even know yourself. You look over there and say, who is that? That couldn't be Whirly. I, he's so full of flaws, but I don't see any. And I'll be looking at you and say, that couldn't be John. My, my, he had so many things wrong with him. He's like me. But when I look at him in the, you know, after Jesus is done his thing with us. It's going to be wonderful. Did you know that? You say, oh, I don't believe in that. Well, you don't believe what it says then. Well, what difference does it make how you live? It makes a lot of difference. Because you get your new body. You get your holiness because of the blood of Jesus. You get rewards or suffer lots of rewards because you did or did not obey the Lord here while you live. I heard a sermon years and years ago in the church. A fellow was talking about said, this is the dressing room. You're getting ready for heaven. You're getting dressed to go to heaven. And it does make a difference. You will suffer loss of reward, not salvation, because you, how could you lose something Jesus bought? He didn't turn that over to you. Did Jesus give you his salvation to hold? You got it in your pocket. Hmm? Where is your where is your redemption? Hmm? Where did he say your redemption was? Our redemption is kept in heaven, right? Where nobody gets at it. I am so glad. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't it make you nervous to have your salvation around the house? <laughs> I mean, supposing it was something you could put in your pocket or, or, you know, put in a pouch or something. This is my salvation. Infinitely precious. Wonderful. Suppose somebody comes and steal it. Suppose the devil tricked me and trade me out of it. But God didn't do that. Our salvation, our redemption is in heaven. Preserved in heaven for you. That's so we never have to worry about losing it. Because it's in the hands of the one who bought it. And he called us out of his uh, darkness into his marvelous light. And it's his business, by the way, to get us there. Did you know that? A lot of people think it's their job to get people to heaven. 
Now we can point the way, but we can't get them there. I can go out here on the expressway where it says Chicago. I say, good, that's where I want to go. I climb up on that sign and sit up there. Wait, wait. You say, what are you doing? I'm going to Chicago. <laughs> I'm on this sign. Isn't this sign right? The other sign's right. But you're never going to get to Chicago. Yes, I am. I'm sitting on the right sign. You don't get to Chicago by sitting on the right sign. You follow the right signs, and that's how you get there. Listen, we can be signposts, true signposts, pointing the right way to heaven. And if people follow the truth, as one, body, one young man testified, he, he led me into truth or he told me the truth. We can be signposts, if we know the word, to point others and show them the way. But Jesus is the one that does the saving, doesn't it? Well, he says... For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, Jesus also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. When Jesus took a body and died on the cross, he destroyed the power of death. Remember over in Romans it talks about, O oh, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The thing that keeps men in bondage is a fear of death. Things that keeps a lot of Christians in bondage to fear is the fear they're going to lose the marvelous salvation that Jesus has bought. Well, if it was left up to us, we would. There's no doubt about it. The devil would outsmart us. The enemy would fool us. We'd get careless. We'd do this, that, and that. But because Jesus is keeping us for us, how wonderful. Now, we don't have to worry about keeping our salvation. Our business is to keep on the trail that he wants us to walk down here. But he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Thank God the power of death has been destroyed. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Remember the terror of death? The awful fear of dying. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Jesus took a body in order to identify with sinful man. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor, to come to the rescue of them who are tempted. Did you know that when you're going through temptation, Jesus was hit by that same thing? The pull was on him too. And he understands it. A lot of times, you know, you say, well, I talked to somebody, but they didn't understand how hard it is for me. Do you know one who does understand how hard it is for you? That's Jesus. He understands. And that's why you can always go to him and get help from him. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, the sent forth one, and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, the Father, that had appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Remember, Moses was a type of Jesus. He was faithful in all his things. God gave him to him. He was faithful. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who has built the house has more honor than the house. The fellow who constructs the house is smarter than the house, isn't he? You look at a house and you say, my, what a wonderful uh, construction man built this thing to put it together and make it so beautifully, fit together so well. Every house is built by some man, and he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope, firm to the end. How in the world are we going to hold firm to the end? Only one way, by his grace. How'd you get saved? By his grace. How'd you get faith? By the Holy Spirit giving you faith. 
Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It all revolves around the word of God. It all revolves around the person and work of Jesus Christ. There's no way you can get away from it. The entire Christian life is there. And we're going to have to pause now because our time has gone scooting by on us. So let's put, let's put a stop there. Maybe we'll come back another time. If you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus in your heart, of course, the main problem, the biggest problem you have is your relationship to Jesus. If you've never asked him in your heart, are you not sure you have? Wouldn't you like to? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never done this or you're not sure about it, wouldn't you like to? Get it settled once and for all so that you'll know that he's in your heart. If you're having problems getting it settled, by all means, come to the front during the invitation and just say, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. Someone will sit down with the Word of God, go over the plan of salvation, be sure that you are resting firmly on what God says about salvation. Now, if that's not the, your problem, but you're driven, harassed, tormented, and this is producing compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops, or even reverses spiritual growth and progress, let us encourage you to come for deliverance. These signs shall follow them that believe, and my name shall they cast out devils. This is done by prayer in Jesus' name. We have a power of attorney, and there are many people here who could help you and seek to help you with your problems. Now remember this, slaves who love their chains can never be free. If you love the way you are, if you're satisfied the way you are, you, can, you can't get any deliverance. Don't blame it on the church. Don't blame it on the deliverance worker. It's up to you whether you really want to get delivered or not. But if you really want help, by all means, we encourage you to come. Another sign that follows believers, they shall speak with new tongues. If you don't have this gift from the Lord, you can have it. Someone here could share with you. If you come and indicate an interest, they'll share with you, pray with you, help you to receive it. It's a gift, just like your salvation. And another sign is they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So if you have physical needs, by all means, come. And there are people to pray in Jesus' name for your healing. Let's, let's stand. And as we go.